This is chapter six, uh, employment standards legislation. We will be focusing in BC, uh, not Alberta. And this is the main act, the main uh, legislation uh, for our course. So most of the rights, many of the rights and responsibilities uh, for employment relationships, they arise out of the employment standards uh, legislation. So the objectives for this chapter are to understand the purpose of the Employment Standards Act of BC with regards to the minimum rights for the employees. And then we'll identify the minimum standards relating to wages, hours of work, holidays, overtime pay, vacation, and some leaves. We also uh, try to identify uh, the protections that are available to the employees uh, with regards to their rights and leaves. And we also uh, look at how those rights and protections are enforced. Uh, I've anticipated already and I emphasize here um, most rights under the Employment Standards Act. They are complaint based. So in other words, you do not sue the employer, but you file a complaint with the uh, employment uh, branch. So the key features of this legislation. So we're talking about the Employment Standards Act. The key features are that uh, this act sets out the minimum terms and conditions of work so we're talking about the minimum. If both employee and employer agree on more than the minimum, it is fine. However, if they agree on less than the minimum, then uh, it is not fine. It is illegal. It is um, void. Uh, there are minimum requirements for termination, for pay, such as minimum wage, uh, vacation entitlement, etc. Um, as I just mentioned, they cannot be undercut. Uh, if the, the employer promises a greater right or benefit, then this will be enforced. They will be uh, binding on both. And the Employment Standards Act covers most employees, but there are some exceptions, and we'll see them. Um, in a minute. As I said, enforcement is complaint based. So you file a complaint saying you're not being paid overtime properly, um, you are not giving your vacation, or you're not being paid vacation, you were denied a leave, a statutory leave, um, you have a right, etc. Um, this act also covers uh, unionized employees. Um, However, uh, most of the rights for unionized employees, they, are, they come from their collective agreement. Uh, in case the collective agreement is silent in um, any aspects, then the Employment Standards Act uh, apply there. And the, those standards, they bind uh, all employers regardless of their size. But remember here we are talking about provincially regulated employers okay we're not talking about federally regulated ones so uh, all uh, employers and employees uh, under the province that are uh, not covered by the canada labor code they are uh, bound by the employment um, standards uh, act and exclusions, they come from regulations. And some exclusions are members of professional associations, for example, lawyers, um, could be accountants, uh, when they are working on their own firms, so accountant firms, uh, law firms, etc. cetera. Um, also workers in job creation or work experience programs. And as mentioned before, 
uh, employees under federal jurisdiction who will be covered by the Canada Labor Code and independent contractors and self-employed. So none of those um, are covered by the Employment Standards Act, meaning they do not enjoy the rights uh, under the Employment Standards Act. And some employees, they are uh, exempt from portions of the Employment Standards Act. Uh, so unionized employees, they uh, are mostly bound by their collective agreement and the Employment Standards Act will only apply um, if the collective agreement is silent. And for managers, for example, managers, they are not entitled to overtime um, or they do not have any hours of work protection. So it means they are exempt from uh, overtime pay. Uh, courts, however, they always uh, interpret those exemptions in a narrow way because those are exclusions and exclusions will also be interpreted in favor of employees. Um, so um, the first requirement or the first duty for employers is to keep employment records. They have to keep those records for at least four years after the employment ends and they have to be kept in English. They have to be available, readily available, um, if there's an inspection by the Employment Standards uh, Officer. Uh, but in the, the good side, they may be used to protect the employer. Uh, let's say the employee some years later uh, files a complaint or tries to sue the employee or the employer <clears throat> for a wrong, wrongful dismissal, for example. And then by keeping uh, the employment records, the employee may have uh, the true um, history of the employment of the employee's relationship with the company. Uh, wages. So wages, they have to be paid um, semi-monthly and they have to be paid within eight days after the end of the pay period or before. So for example, at BCAT, our uh, pay period ends on a Saturday and then we are paid on the coming Friday. Uh, so it's seven days before. So that pay has to take place up to eight days uh, after uh, the pay period and everyone is entitled to be paid every two weeks or every 15 days which is semi-monthly so that is um, mandatory partial payment is prohibited so you are entitled to half of your payment and cash check or direct deposit they are all acceptable uh, with regards to the statement of our wage, so the statement has to be given by payday, uh, not later than the payday, and it may include um, as much information as the employer wants, but at least what the pay period is, what the hours uh, worked were, uh, the component of earnings, if you were uh, hours, uh, any overtime, um, if there's bonus, commission, uh, etc. And then it will also, it has also to contain any deductions, uh, could be statutory deductions or any other uh, deductions, such as for unionized employees, uh, the union dues. And it has to show the net amount of wage. So, uh, both the gross and the net uh, will be shown there. And it has to be in writing, uh, but it may be available uh, online or can be sent by email uh, if the employee has uh, access um, to those systems. And the employee may also request um, the statement 
uh, to be given in paper copy if they want to. But they would need to request this. Uh, with regards to deductions, so uh, let me just correct here. They are five uh, possible deductions. And those five deductions are, first of all, the statutory deductions, so income tax, uh, employment um, insurance, CPP, court order deductions. So let's say the employee has a debt, a court debt, and the court orders uh, their wages to be deducted by the employer and be paid directly to the creditor. Uh, could also be for family support. So whenever there's a court order for that deduction, so it will be deducted and the employer will pay directly uh, to the creditor. It could also be a deduction related to uh, the collective agreement. So the union dues is the uh, most common uh, deduction authorized by a collective agreement. Uh, could also be uh, signing uh, part of the wage uh, to a creditor, but in this case, it, it is not a court order, but still, uh, but still, but yet the employee uh, would tell the, the employer that uh, they want to assign 10%, 20%, 40% of their wage uh, to a creditor. So in this case, if it's not a court order, the employee would need to give a written authorization for uh, such deduction. And on the employer side, it is very important to actually have such uh, written authorization um, just to protect uh, them in the future. And one, one important thing here to note is that the employees cannot authorize any deduction for faulty work or for uh, lost cash or even lost property. So if the employee causes damage, losses to the employer, the employer cannot recover those damages, those losses from the employee's wage. The employer has to uh, either sue the employee or negotiate to be paid. But this can, but those cannot be deducted from uh, the wage. And the last form of um, deduction that is allowed is if there was an overpayment or if there was an advance uh, of wage. Um, so in this case, uh, the employer can deduct what was overpaid, that uh, amount in excess. So those are the five um, allowed deductions in, for the employee's wages under the uh, Employment Standards Act. Uh, it is possible to vary those standards. So let's say the employer and employee, they want to agree in a way to vary uh, what the, the Employment Standards Act uh, determines, what it's set. Uh, they would need to uh, ask for the Director of Employment uh, for such variation, and they would need to justify why they want to. So, for example, uh, for clothing requirements. So, one example, let's say uh, both uh, the employee and the employer uh, agree on a type of uniform. Um, so they would uh, file a request for the Director of Employment uh, to either grant or to allow them to wear the uniform and for the uniform to be a condition uh, while working for that company. So those are agreements to vary the standard. Okay. Not so common, but they are possible. So let's look at the minimum standards now in more details. We'll be looking at the minimum wage, hours of work, overtime, vacation, holidays, leaves, um, and then some termination rules. Actually, termination will uh, be looking uh, in a future chapter. So first of all, minimum wage. Well. 
uh, employers they are required to pay at least the minimum wage at least the minimum wage and what is the minimum wage here in bc the minimum wage here in bc is 1460 um, since last june june 2020 and it will be 1520 uh, june 1st this year so so it will be increased to uh, 1520 uh, by june 1st 21 uh, 2021 so that's the minimum wage that's the minimum someone can get uh, while working uh, however uh, we have the liquor servers uh, wage it is different from the minimum wage because it was understood in the past that because liquor servers uh, they usually make uh, tips so their minimum wage should be a bit lower and also for living camp leaders uh, their minimum wage is uh, different so for liquor servers uh, the current minimum wage is 13 uh, 95. However, it will be increased to 1520 by June 1st this year. So it means the general minimum wage and the liquor service minimum wage from June 1st this year on, they will be the same. They will not be different anymore as it is nowadays. Okay, so that's very interesting. The province meant this. Uh, some years ago and from June 1st this year on um, 2021 so the general minimum wage will be increased from 1460 to 1520 and for liquor servers it will be increased from 1395 to 1522 and for living um, camp leaders so they get for their minimum wages for a day and it is currently $116.86 and it will be increased in June 1st, 2021 to $121.65. Uh, so those are different uh, minimum wages. Again, for liquor servers, uh, it will be the same as the general minimum wage uh, from June 1st, 2021 on. And as we mentioned already in the past, uh, the Employment Standards Act is a provincial act. It means it, each province has their own Employment Standards Act. In other words, each province will have their own minimum wage. As you can see here in the map, in Alberta, it, it is already $15, uh, the minimum wage. However, in Saskatchewan, it is $11.45. None of it, sixteen dollars. So, a um, an employee who works for um, let's get a um, national chain, so for uh, Starbucks or for Tim Hortons in Saskatchewan, if they get the minimum wage, they will be paid eleven forty five. And an employee with the same job duties, also getting a minimum wage here in BC, would be getting fourteen. Uh, 60. This is because the Employment uh, Standards Act, they vary from province to province, and so does the minimum wage. Uh, with regards to working, so the, the, the wage, uh, the minimum uh, wage when there's no work. So BC has this two-hour rule. What is the two-hour rule? It is if you show up to work and then um, your supervisor or manager says, hey, well, we don't need you here today. It's not that busy, etc." So they have to pay you at least two hours of work because you showed up to work. If they told you um, the day before, if that wasn't your schedule and you made a mistake, then they do not have to pay you. But if you showed up to work because you were scheduled to work that day, um, you have to be paid at least two hours of work, even if you don't work. Um, if um, you were scheduled to work for more than eight hours, 
then the minimum would be four. So you show up to work, you were scheduled to work 12 hours, let's say, and then they sent you home, you have to be paid at least for four hours. In any circumstances, uh, let's say you were scheduled to work eight hours, you showed up to work, after three hours you were sent home, or after four hours you were sent home. So in those circumstances, you would need to be paid the actual amount of hours uh, you worked, okay? So again, if you are scheduled to work up to eight hours and you are sent home without uh, any hours worked, you are entitled to minimum two hours. If you were scheduled for more than eight hours and you have not worked, you are entitled to minimum four hours. And if you worked less or fewer hours than your schedule, um, you are entitled to not only to that minimum, but at least uh, the amount of the actual worked hours. So that is known as the two hour uh, rule. Um, this, this rule will not apply uh, if you uh, showed up to work, but you were unfit to work. So let's say when the employee is under the influence of um, illegal substances or uh, alcohol or without um, safety equipment, then uh, the two hour rule does not apply because in this case, the employee uh, was at fault. It was not the employer. So, um, it is important to um, keep in mind you need to be fit to work um, and wearing any safety equipment you would have um, to. Okay, uh, and again, if you worked for some time and then after that time you became unfit to work, uh, let's say after lunch, the employee drank alcoholic drinks during lunch, uh, so the employee is sent home, but they are entitled to be paid the actual amount of hours they worked uh, before lunch. Uh, so, hours of work and rest. There's no maximum hours of work in BC. So yes, an employee may work 24 hours in a day. Yes, there is no fixed uh, number of hours. However, <clears throat> the prohibition is related to if the excessive hours, more than eight, more than 12, more than 20, if those excessive hours are detrimental to the employee, to the employee's health or safety, then there's a limit. So the limit here is a subjective limit, not an objective, because each person, each position, each job will have a different assessment on uh, the excessiveness of hours uh, worked in a day. So there's no maximum uh, hours of work. Yes, an employee could be working 20 hours in a day. Yes, they could. Okay. Uh, what happens, however, is that if you work more than eight hours, then you are entitled to overtime. So the way we read this is that it is not illegal to work more than eight hours, more than 12, more than 20. No, it's not illegal as long as the employee's health and safety are maintained in good order. So remember, health and safety are um, the aspects to be assessed, to be looked at. However, it is not illegal, as I said. However, an employee who works uh, more than eight hours then uh, will be entitled to overtime pay. So we'll be discussing overtime pay um, in a minute. But keep that in mind that there's no maximum uh, amount of hours. Um, hours free of work. So an employee has 
to have at least eight uh, consecutive hours uh, off free from work between shifts and 32 consecutive hours off every work week but again if the employee does not have either the eight from one day to the other or 32 from one work week to the other it doesn't mean it is illegal no it's not illegal it just means that overtime pay um, the employee will be entitled to overtime pay so this is how we look at uh, hours of work and hours free uh, from work and employees who uh, decide not to work on uh, some days or some yeah, mostly some days so for some religions on Fridays others on Saturdays um, there may be other days I'm not aware of but um, the employer may consider this um, because if the employer says no in principle it may constitute a uh, human right uh, discrimination so one ground of discrimination there are exceptions we will, we will discuss these exceptions um, when we are in the human rights uh, chapter but in principle the uh, employee has a right uh, not to work on a specific day due to their uh, religion for example eating period so here in bc um, after five hours of work the employee is entitled to half an hour uh, eat, eating period if this eating period this break is unpaid the employee can leave uh, the work the workplace the employer's uh, premises if it is paid then uh, the employer may request the employee to stay uh, in the premises okay um, the employer may require the employee to work longer more than five hours without a break only on exceptional circumstances such as um, accidents urgent work uh, etc and in this case if this is the case the uh, meal break will count then as uh, time worked so that will have to uh, be paid coffee break so there is no statutory obligation for the employer to provide coffee break to the employee however if the employee uh, sorry if the employer offers this uh, it then becomes a benefit and because the employer will be offering a 15 minute coffee break uh, and it is paid it becomes a benefit then the employee is required to stay in the workplace okay but in principle it's not an obligation for the employer but they may employers are more and more offering uh, other benefits more benefits to employees uh, due to some uh, difficulty uh, hiring a good person overtime pay so how does overtime pay work uh, overtime pay is separate from the limits uh, on hours of work and here in bc the rule is the 840 rule so if you work more than eight hours or more than 40 hours per week then you are entitled to uh, overtime pay so overtime pay will be paid on a 1.5 times uh, the regular rate when you work over uh, eight hours in a day or if you worked uh, over than uh, more than 40 hours in a week or uh, overtime pay will be two times the regular wage um, if you work over 12 hours uh, in a day so in a 13 hour shift for example you are entitled to your regular wage up to eight hours uh, from eight hours until the um, the end of the 11th hour 
uh, 1.5 times your regular rate and then from the the last hour the 13th hour uh, you would be entitled to two times uh, your regular uh, wage so that's how uh, overtime pay works and by the way uh, according to uh, research in Canada overpay uh, overtime pay is the most complained of a right of employees here in Canada for either uh, of those two reasons one because the employer does not keep proper accurate records for uh, hours of work or even though uh, the employer keeps uh, proper records they don't pay uh, properly uh, the overtime so um, this is how overtime pay works uh, there are exceptions with the averaging agreement. We'll, we'll see in a minute what an averaging agreement is. And some jobs, some positions, they are exempt from uh, overtime pay. And the main one is for manager. So if you are a supervisor or a manager, and not only on the job title, but if you perform um, duties, that are uh, supervisory or managerial uh, on a daily basis, then um, you are not entitled to overtime. Okay. Uh, one misconception that I uh, learned that is out there with uh, many of the students is that when the employees is uh, paid on a salary, they are not paid on a wage, on an hourly wage, but on a salary, uh, they believe they are not entitled to overtime. Yes, they are. Employees on a wage, hourly wage, or on a salary, they are both entitled to overtime. You are not entitled to overtime if you are a manager or supervisor. But the way you get paid, either by salary or by hourly uh, wage, doesn't matter you are entitled to overtime pay if you work more than eight hours in a day or 12 hours in a day or 40 hours in a week so keep that in mind that is very important uh, averaging agreement so what are those uh, there are companies that uh, want their employees to work in a longer shift so they make an averaging agreement uh, and by the way this is a true example my first um, job here in Canada. I worked for a truck company and we had an averaging agreement uh, with the employer. So I had shifts of 12 hours, but in a week I worked three days only, so 36 hours in total. And in the other week I would work four days, so 48 hours uh, in that week. So uh, summing up, uh, sum on up uh, those two amounts, uh, we would have 36 plus uh, 48, that is, uh, so 70, 84, 84 hours, and then divided by two, divided by two weeks, so we have the 42 hours per week, so we were only paid uh, overtime pay uh, for two hours each week because we were in an averaging agreement okay so let let me repeat this uh, in a given week employees worked for three days only 12 hours each day so 36 hours in total in the coming week they would work for four days Again, 12 hours each day. So in this case, the second week would be 48 hours in total. So to avoid paying this eight hours uh, as overtime pay, we were on an averaging agreement. So we would sum up the number of hours of those two weeks and then divide by two because they are two weeks. So the, 80, uh, the 36 plus 48 is 84 divided by 2, 42, 
it's still over 40 so we were still entitled to be paid overtime uh, pay uh, for two hours uh, every week but not uh, more than this okay and those averaging agreements you see uh, uh, they may uh, range from one to four weeks in my example they were for two weeks every two weeks and uh, employers cannot impose them so the employee uh, must agree uh, in real life actually when you get the job they say hey here in this company we work with averaging agreement so you either accept it or not so there there's actually no negotiation it's just the way it works so by signing the employment agreement you are accepting to be on the uh, averaging agreement uh, scheme okay uh, there are some uh, restrictions for those averaging agreements and the main one I want to highlight is that those averaging agreements they have to be in writing they cannot be verbal so that's the main uh, requirement for them uh, with overtime we also have the opportunity to uh, bank uh, the overtime so instead of being paying we can we may bank uh the overtime uh, work so in this case we would request in writing to the employer and the time banked would be based on either 1.5 times or 2.5 times uh, the number of hours we worked uh, overtime and then when we use the overtime bank at the banked uh, time we can take some uh, paid time off or we may be paid for those hours uh, we may also request to close uh, the bank uh, and be paid but um, we need to give at least uh, six months uh, notice to the employer but that's our uh, option and it's uh, in most cases it is um, negotiated uh, between this the individual employee and uh, the employer So now a uh, uh, true or false question for you. You may pause. So the answer here, uh, under um, the BC Employment Standards Act, parties to an employment relationship are not obliged to get approval from the Director of Employment uh, standards to implement an averaging agreement. The answer here is true. Yes, there's no need for the Director of Employment to approve this. Uh, the need is to vary the standards um, and an averaging agreement is not varying, varying the standards but actually uh, making an average of hours, uh, work hours from one to up to four weeks so that uh, some overtime is avoided. Now looking at vacation. So, uh, the employee must have worked at least one year, 12 months, uh, to be entitled to go on vacation. And so you work the first year, you are entitled to go on vacation. Then you have up to one year to enjoy your vacation. And the minimum uh, period for vacation is two weeks. And this minimum uh, period of time will increase to three weeks after five years of uh, consecutive uh, work or service to that employer okay so you started working uh, january 2020 so now january 2021 you are now entitled to go on vacation so from now on you have up to one year to enjoy your vacation to take your two weeks uh, two week vacation period uh, many employers um, Offer, are offering now three week vacation period. Again, employers are trying to offer more benefits so they can hire uh, better and better um, professionals. Okay, again, you can always, employers can always offer more than the minimum, but never less than the minimum. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> the time off for those levels for vacation for the statutory leave they um, will count for your entitlement for vacation okay so you have some uh, if you have some uh, time off 
uh, they are counted, so they are deducted from um, your entitlement uh, to vacation. Uh, and then when you want to go on vacation, so you can either go on a full two week period or you can just go on a one week and then some months later, weeks later, you take another week. Uh, this is the employee's choice. And um, your entitlement, uh, not entitlement, sorry, uh, the time uh, you can go on vacation, the two week period, uh, they may be reduced. Uh, in case you were absent from work or in case you were on a leave, maternity leave, parental and other leaves, uh, we'll see in a minute. And uh, in some cases, uh, the employer can determine when the vacation must be taken. Um, mostly for uh, manufacturing plants, when they have a, a seasonal plant shutdown, for example, so they can demand uh, that employees go on vacation on that period of time because there's no work. So let's send uh, everyone on vacation. Uh, <clears throat> so that is uh, possible. Remember that any vacation time has to be enjoyed, has to be taken within uh, 12 months after entitlement. Now we look at vacation pay. So vacation pay is different. Vacation pay is different because uh, we actually, an employee is actually entitled to vacation pay from day one. So I told you that you are only entitled to go on vacation after one year of service, after 12 months of service. However, an employee is entitled to vacation uh, sorry, vacation pay from day one. So from day one, the employee is entitled to minimum 4% of the wages earned. And as I said, begins immediately. And they must also include any overtime pay, any holiday pay, uh, commission bonuses. So everything uh, that is included in your pay, um, vacation pay, has to be paid on them as well. Okay, so uh, they can be, the vacation pay may be paid actually in money to the employee in two different ways. They may be paid at least seven days before the vacation, when you go on vacation, or, which is very common, the second way is to pay on every payday. So on every uh, pay stub, the employee gets the 4% uh, vacation pay. But that's on the option of the employer. So the employer is the one to decide whether they want to pay uh, the lump sum at least seven days before you go on vacation, or if they want to pay uh, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, uh, in other words, in each of the employee's uh, pay stops. Okay? So, again, do not confuse when you are entitled to vacation pay and vacation uh, period. Go on vacation. Uh, let's now talk about uh, the statutory hell, uh, holidays. Uh, here, I just want to uh, mention or emphasize two. So we saw the statutory holidays for uh, the Canada Labor Code, the federal ones. If you may remember they are in total nine, one different from the provincial statutory holiday here in BC is that um, the Canada Labor Code has Boxing Day as a statutory holiday and there isn't such a holiday here in the province. However, we have two more. We have BC Day and we also have Family Day here in BC. And all others, they are similar to the one for federal, uh, federally regulated employees. So again, for uh, federal, federally regulated employees, nine in total, and Boxing Day is the one 
that is there, but not here in the province. Uh, provincially, in BC, we have 10 in total. We do not have Boxing Day, but we have Family Day and uh, BC Day. With regards to statutory holiday, so um, if you work on a holiday, uh, you have to be paid 1.5 times your regular uh, rate, and your regular rate will be at least uh, the average of uh, your day pay. And uh, parties may substitute the day off, uh, let's say uh, for uh, Remembrance Day, um, let's say it, it's on a, not Remembrance Day, uh, let me think about another one here. Um, yeah, let's let, yeah let's take a Remembrance Day. So let's say it, it's on a Wednesday, and then employers and employee employees uh, the employer and the employee agree that they will work on a Wednesday, but they will take the Friday off or the coming Monday off. So they may agree uh, to have the day off for that statutory holiday on a different day. Um, if there is such an if there is not such an agreement and an employee does work on a holiday uh, for companies that operate on a 24 7 365 then as i said there the employee is entitled to 1.5 times their uh, regular rate uh, you only qualify for the statutory holiday a paid statutory holiday uh, if you have worked at least 30 days um, in the 12 months preceding the holiday and 15 days, uh, 15 out of the 30 days before uh, the holiday itself. And if you are uh, on vacation or you are uh, on a day off, your scheduled day off for that week, uh, which is a statutory holiday, you do not lose uh, your right uh, to be paid on a statutory holiday. So, yeah, let's say Friday, statutory holiday, but Friday is my uh, day off, uh, by the way, because my, my day offs are usually on Thursdays and Fridays. So, in these circumstances, I would be normally paid uh, for the statutory uh, holiday. Okay.